text this morning once again comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23, beginning with verse 1. Then Jesus said to the crowds and his disciples, The scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others. But they are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructor, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of God for you, the people of God. May we pray. Lord, it's not easy to speak to so many and yet speak to each the word most needed for each one. Not easy to speak the word most needed when we're not sure what needs plead the most to be met. So we ask that you grant now that the light might shine on some darkness, some ointment laid on some wound and some fire rekindled into some gallant resolve. For we ask it in your son's name and for his sake. Amen. Before we get started, I want to thank um, the the choir and the praise band last week and uh, Norman and uh, Jonathan and Emily for delivering such a fine message. It was an exceptional fifth Sunday and I really enjoyed it. You know, being a minister, what I miss the most is being able to sit there and worship. And uh, so when I get to do that, it's really a blessing for me to just to get to sit in worship. And it was a great experience for me last week. There was a pastor of a church who was sitting in her study when the phone rang and the voice on the other end said, Hello, is this Reverend Kevin Marsh, uh, Catherine Marsh? And she said, Yes, it is. And he said, well, this is Bill Johnson from the IRS. I'm an investigating agent. And I was wondering if I might ask you a few questions. And she says, sure, how may I help you? Well, do you know a man by the name of John Sampsonite? Well, yes, I do. He's a member of my church. Well, good, 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 he said. Well, let me ask you this. Did he donate $50,000 to your church? Well, he will. (laughs) Now, what does that have to do with the text? I'm not sure. It may be nothing. Maybe something. In today's text, Jesus is still dealing with those pesky Pharisees. And we've been dealing with them now for over six weeks. And we may have gotten tired of hearing about Pharisees. And I haven't read ahead. Do you know if we're dealing with them next week? Okay, she hadn't read ahead either, so not sure if we're dealing with them next week, but it's been a while, and uh, it's tough because uh, they get a lot of bad press, and it would be good for us to understand who the Pharisees actually were. They formed, you see, uh, around the 4th century when uh, Hellenism was, had dominated Judaism. Uh, the uh, Antiochus Epiphanes had conquered that area, and he was pushing Hellenistic ways, and the, the rabbis were rebelling against those Hellenistic ways. And a, a, a rabbi by the name of Judas Maccabeus launched a revolt against the Greeks. And he realized early on in the battles that the Greeks knew that the Jews would not fight on the Sabbath, that they had dietary restrictions, on and on and on. And so the Greeks actually used those laws against the Jewish military. 
Well, Judas Maccabeus, the rabbi, decided he would outlaw the laws. In other words, his soldiers would be able to fight on the Sabbath. They would be able to kill on the Sabbath. They would be able to eat anything they wanted on the Sabbath. Out the door went the kosher laws. They'd be able to eat without washing their hands. On and on and on, so they could defeat the Greeks. Well, the conservative element back there in Jerusalem was really upset. Although they appreciated the fight against Hellenism, they didn't appreciate the law as being reduced. And those people back in Jerusalem uh, decided that the reason they were suffering at the hands of the Greeks to begin with was because the nation had broken the laws of God. So they created these lesser laws. These, they, they put a hedge around the Mosaic laws to protect those ten laws. Well, they come up with about 613 primary laws to protect ten laws. And then they come up with a thousand other little laws to protect those 613 laws. So you can imagine heavy burden on the shoulders of the people. Okay. Now, Pharisees developed from that mindset, and they wanted to be holy. They wanted to be blameless for God, and, and for them nothing, at, nothing else mattered. Tradition and law superseded everything, including human need. And Jesus re-challenged this time and time again, which angered the Pharisees. They despised Jesus because Jesus was telling the truth. Human need was more important to him than any tradition or law. Pharisees, especially what the Pharisees had created. Uh, when the ox is in the ditch, remember what Jesus said? What happens? You get the ox out of the ditch. It doesn't matter what day of the week it is. Now, it would be good for us to remember that you just could not spot a Pharisee. Now, they like their phylacteries on their heads to be big, and they like their tassels to be long, but generally speaking, you could not spot a Pharisee because Phariseeism was not in garments. Phariseeism was actually in the mind. Phariseeism was a way of looking at self and a way of looking at the world. It was a mindset. Uh, and this, this mindset became the most powerful group in Judaism at that time. They owned, or they thought, they owned uh, the, the temple. They owned the traditions. They owned the culture. Uh, they, they, they owned the um, Sanhedrin. And they wanted to be honored and celebrated in every walk of life. And they raised themselves up to be the most powerful and wealthiest and dominant group of that day. Now, they thought to be great, to be great was to be just like them. Sort of like in Plato's Republic, Plato is the top of it, right? You know, the philosophers at the top. Well, they think, these Pharisees, if you're going to be great in that culture, in that religion, you've got to be like them, you've got to think like them, you've got to act like them, and you've got to want and need the same kinds of things that they wanted and needed. Well, not according to Jesus. Jesus saw things quite differently. He saw greatness, you see. Not in a who, what, when, where, why, and how much. Jesus saw greatness as a spiritual quality. Jesus saw greatness as a dynamic trait. A dynamic dimension. Now there's a part of me, there is a part of me that sympathizes with these people. They're afraid. They don't want more harm to come to their nation. They want to be blameless and holy before God. But the fatal flaw was they had separated themselves from other human need. They didn't care if you hurt. They didn't care if you suffered. They didn't care if you died. They were the most important thing in their universe, in their world. Sort of sounds like our modern culture in a lot of ways, does it not? What does it take to be great today? What does it take? Postmodern Western society, I think, is very much akin to that pharisaical way of thinking. You know, generals receive honor, how? By winning battles. Business executives get honor by elevating the company and making more money for the company. 
They get notoriety when they get wealthy themselves. You know, and it's not enough just to play on a sports team anymore. You have to be uh, great at it. You have to be fantastic at it. You know, you have to get an award. And it's the same with movie stars. It's not enough to be in a movie. You've got to win the Academy Award to be great. Now, there was a deep problem with these Pharisees. They expected, again, everyone to follow all those little laws and the laws of Moses, except who? Themselves. Themselves. They found ways, because they had the scribes, they had the lawyers, all in their little pharisaical group, who knew how to run around the edges of the law. Sounds a lot like Washington, D.C., doesn't it? But they knew how to go around the edges of the law. They knew how to circumvent it. So they held others to a standard they themselves would not keep. Can you say hypocrite? Can you say hypocrite? But Jesus saw through that, and he exposed it. He exposed it. He said, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the shoulders of others. And they're unwilling to lift a finger to help them. Then he exposed their shallowness in this text when he said they love to have the place of honor and authority at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplace. No wonder they hated and despised him. He didn't espouse their insider-outsider mentality. He didn't have their theology, nor their social and political self-glorification. They were great only in their minds and those they dominated. They were not great. They were not great in the eyes of Jesus. There is a different kind of greatness. Uh, It's the type that Jesus advocates. It's a gentle and quiet quiet type of greatness, and so often it gets missed in our hectic and dramatic society today. You know, we have a loud, banging world around us, and the quiet just sometimes gets lost. And you, you rarely see these people in the news. They sacrifice and they make life better for others. They're, they are public school teachers, they're Sunday school teachers, they're civic leaders, scout leaders, uh, they're coaches and they're volunteers all over the world trying to make things better. They're doing ministry and mission and teaching others how to read and write. They're reading stories to children, raising funds for foundations, and ringing bells, and selling tickets. There's an old children's song that shares true greatness, I think, and it goes like this. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be servant of all. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be servant of all. You notice the all there? Not just a few, not just a special, not just the beautiful people, but all. Greatness in the minds of these Pharisees was to have power to have control, to be honored and served, but not according to Jesus. God had ordained them to true greatness, and they had missed the proverbial boat. They went after the wrong kind of greatness. They fell for something far less than what God had intended intended for them to be. They settled on greatness determined and defined by this world, by the physical world, rather than by the spiritual world. Seth Barnes once wrote that if, you, if you're like most people, eventually you'll start believing the lie that you are made for small things and not greatness. But God resurrects hope from despair, allowing our hearts to break in order to give us dreams, dreams of building his kingdom with him. And God has a message for you. God has made you for greatness. And until you embrace this hope, you will never achieve all that he has planned for you. But you have to reinterpret what greatness is there. Great according to God is much different than greatness according to the world. To be great in God's eyes is to seek the small things. 
to seek the small things, to serve God and be great. God has a dream for you, and that is for you and me and us to be servants in God's kingdom. Servants. Now that dream is contrary to the dream of Wall Street or the dream in corporate America, a dream around Washington, D.C. is certainly different than the dream you see in the news shows, uh, and certainly the dream of Hollywood is different from that dream. Those are the secular dreams that have been bar- burned on our souls and we have chased. They are the lies of greatness that we've been settled with. There is a greatness according to the world and there is a greatness according to God. The ultimate question for us today is toward which of those types of greatness have we oriented our lives and what type of greatness are we going to continue to follow or are we going to change and go after the real form of greatness? As Christ's follower, I'm continually haunted by what Jesus said. He said, if you want to be great, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be a servant of all and the greatest among you will be a servant. Now, just in case we've forgotten, let's define what a servant is. Servant, by definition, is one who does the routine, the menial, the mundane, without celebration or recognition. And more often than not, what they do is often missed. We, we don't notice them as much when they do it right, but we do notice them when they don't do it. Think for, think for a second. I saw this actually happen in a restaurant. There was a dear little soul. She must have served a hundred glasses of tea and did it tremendously well. And all of a sudden, she tripped and she dropped the glass and it hit the floor. And guess what happened? Everybody in the restaurant stopped and turned and looked. Isn't that a lot like life? We look for the failure and it resonates louder. Servants are forgotten, invisible, and often obscure. Servants are those picking up... uh, other people and taking them to the doctor. They're, they're on the farm in the heat of day, riding a tractor, planting seed, pulling weeds so you and I can eat. It's someone making calls to make sure the aged and the frail are okay or writing out a card for a birthday or an anniversary or a death. They fold steeples and dish food at the food kitchen. They're studying Sunday school material to teach a Sunday school class when they could be doing a hundred of other things. They're making their way through the sanctuary after a service, picking up papers and reordering hymnals and, and carrying someone's groceries to their car. On and on these servants serve without notoriety and they serve without applause. Jesus challenged those Pharisees And he challenges any of us who have bought into that illusion of greatness in power and control and material and popularity. Greatness in the kingdom of God is backwards. It's upside down. Backward and upside down according to the standards of this world. But what if if greatness in God's country is to live a life of obscurity, of quiet servitude, of meek and gentle helpfulness to other human beings. What kind of country would we have? What if the ordinary, what if the ordinary rather than the exception is God's plan? What if the real intention of the big dream of God's plan is for each one of us to live with as much kindness and humility towards one another as we can from day to day. Remember, according to Jesus, greatness is not found in what we have. Neither is it found in what we achieve. The significance is not in celebration or fame or importance or in self-indulgence. It's found only in the eyes of God. Discovered in what God wants. God wants us to be a servant. And I know, I know, that flies in the face of what we've been taught and, and it flies in the face of um, 
what we're striving to do in our lives today. I know that because who of us have, have taught our children to grow up and be a servant? We don't do that, do we? We teach our children to excel, to exceed, you know, to get the power and the control. We've sought our, uh, we've, you know, we teach them to seek out the brass ring and to get on the pedestal. Think about your personal life for a moment. I bet, I bet, I'll bet, if I were a betting man, I would bet my dollar to your donut. Okay? My dollar to your donut. That the strongest person, the most special person in your life is not a Warren Buffett. Not a Bill Gates. I bet nobody along that line has influenced your life. There's no Wall Street investor. There's no movie star. No. You know who it was? It was some grandparent or parent that sacrificed for you and loved you regardless of your successes or failures. It was a teacher who stayed with you after school because you couldn't get something. And they worked with you till you got it. It was a faithful Sunday school teacher who loved you regardless of what was going on in your life, good or bad. It was a spouse that loved you entirely despite the stupid stuff you said or did or failed to do and believed in you when no one else did. And at the heart of each one of these significant people in our lives, names read here earlier, is the heart of a servant. They weren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but they had servitude in their heart. Should we, should we not have dreams of greatness? Greatness for ourselves? Greatness for our church? Should we not have great dreams that we all become servants in ministry and mission to the least of these and the less of us? Should we not have dreams of greatness as we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ with the commitment to our hearts, minds, and souls? Commitment, I mean, greatness begins and ends in humble servitude. And I'd like to end with two stories. It was 1953, and the Nobel Prize winner of 1952 had arrived by train in a station in Chicago. And the train stopped, and this giant of a man stepped off. He was six foot five, bushy hair, large dramatic mustache, and cameras flashed everywhere. People pushed in, dignitaries wanted to touch him. So they all got in his way, and the, and the man was polite. He thanked them all for being there, and he peered over their heads, as a six-foot-five person could do. He, he peered over their heads, and he noticed this small, frail, African-American woman struggling with two large suitcases. And to the crowd, he said, excuse me. And he worked his way through all that nobility to this African-American woman, took her suitcases, drug him back through that crowd of people, helped her get on the train and bid her a good day, and then went back to the group and apologized for the delay. That man was Albert Schweitzer. Albert Schweitzer, renowned theologian, renowned doctor, renowned organist, renowned writer. He had the heart of a servant. I'm at that point in my life where I, am real, where I have realized this, the small that's truly big. It's the one who mops the floors, empties the trash bins, washes the bed linens that makes it possible for health and wholeness at our hospital. It's the one who washes our dish and serves our food at the restaurant that makes it possible that we can enjoy our meal and not get sick from it. If it were not for those, all, all the skills and doctors and nurses and cooks, uh, it would be valueless because we would be infected. 
but those people in quiet places that are often forgotten who make it possible for average life. No, it's not the dominant and dramatic, the intense and renowned that holds life together. It's the day and day that day and day uh, things that make life hold together. And in matters of faith and spirituality, think of what Jesus said. A cup of cold water in my name opens up eternity. During World War II, the coal miners of Great Britain went on strike. And to remain on strike for any length of time would have called tremendous harm to the war effort. Steel would not have been made and ammunition would not have been, been made, etc., and on and on. And uh, Sir Winston Churchill knew what would happen if these miners stayed on strike any length of time. So he went to the mines and gave a speech. And in the speech he said this, Not too far into the distant future, I will walk the streets of London, and when the war is over, I will ask the factory worker, Where were you when the war was on? And the factory worker will say, I was in the factory working day in and day night, day in and day night for my family and for my country. And I will ask the farmer, where were you when the war was on? And the farmer will say, I was out there in my fields, plowing, planting, pulling weeds for my family and for my country. Churchill then, when, then said, where, he was going to ask the soldier, where were you when the war was on? And the soldier will say, I was in the trenches, in the muck and mire, defending my country for my family and my nation. And then he said, I will meet a coal miner and I will ask, where were you when the war was on? And the miner will say, I was buried deep in the mine with my face up against the coal, mining coal for my family and my country. And at the close of that speech, the miners in silence turned with tears streaming down their faces. You could see the white tracks on their faces. Turned and went back into the mines. Someday the Lord will receive us face to face. I expect the Holy will ask us a question. Where were you while the spiritual war was on in my creation? Where were you? I pray we'll be able to say honestly, Lord, I was out there in the highways and byways. I was out there in the midst of the struggle, serving you and all in your name. So you want to be great? Do you want to be great? Really? Be a servant to all. Amen.